Let's get into it. One, two, three. Hello, we're here with a little a different Monday night on my whiskey den. You notice we have a, a missing panel on the screen. Our leader Patrick is feeling under the weather, so everybody wish him well wishes and getting better. Hopefully, he will join us in the chat and be a nice boy. Uh, before we get started too much, Ben, is there anything that that you need to say? Well, there's the usual housekeeping rules of you better like, you better comment, you better share, and be sure to hit that subscribe button and click that bell notification so you know that when we're producing something and coming out with it, you're ready to get it. All right. All right. So and I'll tell you guys, bear with us because I'm at the controls. It's not Patrick. <laughs> so we're going we're to have a little some skipping around here a little bit as we get through this with our with our guests. So we have, we have Scott and Becky from Catoctin Creek. Um, they I, I will let them tell their story about it, but I find it very interesting. One, working with your spouse. Uh, I think that that's got to be un unique, but also if you guys could tell us how you got started with this, what was your, what was your jobs before and what, what made you make this jump together to start the story? Well, basically, uh, you know, we were both engineers. Um, I was a software engineer and uh, so I graduated from Georgia tech in uh, the nineties and worked in software engineering jobs. Um, Communications and government contracting, mostly here around the DC area. And uh, Becky is a chemical engineer and worked in um, foam, uh, like styrofoam containers, like big foam containers, um, contact lenses, and things like that. And so basically, you know, I was uh, having a little bit of a midlife crisis. And so I, it was around 40, I was thinking I didn't want to sit in a cubicle doing computer work, typing on a computer for the rest of my life. Um, and brought this idea to Becky. Uh, as a chemical engineer, I thought, you know, she'll make a great distiller. And uh, and so I kind of asked her if we could start a distillery. And, uh, you know, her reaction to me was, of course, I'll make a good distiller. Distilling is easy. Um, but can you make any money doing this? And hmm. so her challenge to me was basically go out and write a business plan, and then we'll talk about it. So from... From the startup of the idea to the actual getting the distillery rolling, how long was that process? Um, the, uh, you know, it was a long time to build up to that idea. So it was like two years that I kind of kept thinking I might like to do it, you know, or just fantasizing about it. You know, being an avid whiskey drinker, um, you know, we would go on family trips to Scotland and we'd visit distilleries. We'd go to uh, Ireland and visit distilleries. We'd go to Europe and visit distilleries. And, and so I kind of just uh, was obsessed, you know, with whiskey and the process and like everybody, like everybody on your show, who's watching this, um, you know, the whole, you know, romance of the barrels and all that kind of stuff. And so finally, when I finally, like, on a whim, it was actually on Valentine's Day. So, so yesterday, 12 years ago, um, I was sitting at a computer in front of a legal zoom screen. And I just hit submit. I was like, okay, I just created the company. Like, we're just going to do this. And uh, from that point up until um, our first production, we got licensed on January 4th, 2010. It took about 11 months, just under 11 months, about 10 and a half months to get from, from hitting that button on LegalZoom to writing the business plan to getting the financing at the bank to getting the equipment and the TTB license and making our first drops of whiskey. So, um yeah, about 11 months to, to get it all underway, which was really fast. Um, but back then, you know, the TTB was moving fast. There wasn't a whole lot of craft distillers on the scene yet. Um, and so, like, localities and zoning and all that kind of stuff was a little bit easier back then than it would be today. So when, when did you guys have, I, I guess, when you when you were starting, did you have a certain whiskey or, or spirits in mind, or did that just kind of evolve? No, we experimented and we were doing a lot of brainstorming. I still remember sitting in like our local deli talking about what are we going to name the company and what, what are we going to do? You know, Becky and I are kind of just throwing ideas back and forth. Um, and 
you know, we've played with a, a few different mashes in our, you know, in our garage, just making like, like a home brewer, you know, a beer mash and things like that. And what we settled in on that we really liked um, for both its flavor and the history um, was the uh, rye mash. And so, you know, this 100% rye mash, um, you know, A, it tasted good. That was really the first decision. You know, we, we didn't dig into the history until after we really liked the flavor of the rye mash. And we decided, and we saw, you know, at the time, it was brilliant. You know, there were like two rye brands on the market, and, you know, they were both coming from MGP. And uh, so, you know, we, we thought that was a niche that we could play in a little bit more than, say, bourbon or scotch or something or whatever. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, the history, the way that rye um, was represented, you know, in Virginia's history from Jamestown in 1607 all the way to um, Prohibition, you know, rye was the predominant grain of whiskey in Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, this sort of mid Atlantic area. And so that history was really unknown at the time. Um, and so we really wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit as well. Were you were you guys like into rye? You know, talking about really, you were passionate about whiskey already. Was rye something you really enjoyed to start with, or was this? No, we we weren't we weren't able to find anything that wasn't basically just you know the the couple types of of MGP that were out there. So right. you know, I was drinking scotch. I mean, I was drinking all kinds of scotch. You name it, Krog and 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 uh, Lagavulin and and um, all the Speyside stuff. You know, I was just anything I could get my hands on. In the country, as opposed to now where we have 2200. So it's, it's just, it's, it's really hard to kind of imagine how different the landscape was um from now as to what it was 10 years ago yeah it's it's just exploded and the variety of american whiskeys has exploded as well and there just wasn't anything near that kind of variety at that point yeah. i mean i remember looking at the shelves for like competitive sets and stuff like that and so the only rye whiskeys that were on the shelves at that time was like rye one which is a jim beam product jim beams rye which you know frankly at the time i didn't think it was very good um and uh, Templeton and, you know, like a couple out of Canada. Um, so, you know, and that was our local sort of Virginia ABC, you know, state run stores. So the selection was pretty poor. Um, and so that's why we thought, you know, well, we got some space to, to navigate in here, some a product that's unique and different. So when you, when you guys were going searching for your grains, did you, I'm curious about the pro like starting off new and you're trying to get this distiller going, where did you go for, for trying to find the grains and, and, and what about your yeast that you started with? Well, grains weren't available when we started locally, you know, our vision was ahead of our ability in the beginning. Right. So, you know, our first grains were coming from near you in Kansas um, because that's where we could get good high quality organic rye that we wanted to use. Um, and, uh, so we started with that, you know, and that worked out great, but our vision was always to, to be as hundred percent local as we could. Um, and so, you know, we've evolved into that. So, you know, today, you know, since we've started 12 years ago, you know, now we have farmers who are like, Hey, I want to grow some rye for you. I've got a farm in Rappahannock, which is, you know, three hours east of us in Virginia, or I've got some grain in Loudoun County here where we are, um, that had to get set up you know, we had to sort of prove ourselves and then the farmers are like, oh, well, you know, I can, I can do business with these guys now. Um, so yeah. And, and, you know, we've evolved that in the cooperage as well. You know, our cooperage was originally just Minnesota cooperage because it was really good and we could get our hands on it. Um, but now we've got some Virginia wood that we use um, always the effort to localize our production as we go. Uh, even in the bottles, um, when we first started, we were using stock glass, which is, usually Mexican or Chinese glass. And, uh, and once we got the ability uh, to do it, we, we invested in the molds to get anchor hocking glass, which is made out of Pittsburgh, which is about four hours east of us, or sorry, west of us. Um, and uh, so now even our glass bottles are American made and you could say local four hours away. That's, that's, cool. that's really cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, you mentioned the yeast, by the way. The yeast is um, is a tricky thing. So there's a lot of romance about yeast, and you'll hear a lot of people talking about wild yeast or, or doing their own yeast strains and stuff. And maybe I let Becky talk about it, but you know, we use a commercial yeast because it gives us reliability and consistency, and that's more important than than a lot of the romance stuff when, when it comes to yeast. So are you are you guys because we've we've heard the stories of especially old stories of uh, uh, beam master distillers always having some of the yeast with them at all times, uh, so they knew it was always protected. Are you guys at that point yet where you're you're protecting that to make sure that you you keep your consistency or are you you've been happy with the consistency from the commercial yeast? Your consistency is really more than just what your ingredients are. Your consistency is your ingredients and your processes. So it's it's really a, a I mean, one of the things that when you work at industrial processes as an engineer, it's really about what are all the things that go into making a repeatable process. Just having the same ingredients, you can still screw it up pretty good. So it's it's really the whole package. It's the discipline and the, um, the kind of, of just getting uh, the entire team to understand the kind of the... Um, all the little pieces that help make everything be repeatable day to day. We have, I mean, since we started, you know, we're both engineers, so we kind of fell into this naturally, but, you know, from day one, even when it was just Becky doing it, you know, everything was written out on a spec sheet and every day you'd have to go through there and follow this process rigorously to produce the same whiskey over and over. And, and that process, that rigor, was important for when we got employee number three, you know, after us two, um, and said, okay, now you go make this whiskey that Becky's been making, and it better taste like what Becky makes. Um, so, so I was going to say it was pretty important with employee number two, too. <laughs> yeah, for me, maybe more so for me, because I'm more busy Facebooking than I was doing any damn work. So, yeah. <laughs> and we're, we're big believers in checklists. You know, it's funny because you think about, you know, it's a dangerous job. There's, you know, steam boilers and there's alcohol and, and stuff. And, you know, you have that moment of, did I leave the iron on? You know, when you go home at night and you lock the door and you leave, it's like, oh crap, did I turn the boiler off? Did I do this? Did I do that? And so the best way is to have these checklists and we still do them on a clipboard next to the door and you got to be like, okay, boiler off, check, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So, that you know, you did that checklist so you can go home at night and like relax and not stress out about these little anxieties. Yeah. So we, we have our first question from the chat. We actually have a couple of them. This is from our, our friend Mitch, who is, uh, he was a cooper. He's saying, asking, you guys have a cooperage? We, we don't do a cooperage. I mean, I okay. Lord, we take barrels apart, but we don't put them together very well. Um, the uh, We use a couple cooperages. So we use um, the barrel mill up in... Um, uh, Minnesota, Avon, Minnesota, great people. They've been with us since the very start. I think we both started our companies just about the same time. And so Richard Hobbs and all the guys up there in Minnesota are making just wonderful barrels. It's a great company. Um, cold as crap up there right now. Um, the uh, uh, the Charwa Cooperage um, is another one that we've been using for some Virginia wood that we get. Um, there's actually a new cooperage here in Virginia as well called Speyside Cooperage. There's also West Virginia Great Barrel Company. West Virginia. So there's more and more. Just like when we started, there was nothing. There was one. And now that we have choices. It's amazing. You know, it's something that, you know, didn't exist 12 years ago. I tend to be pretty deliberate about adding changes. Just um, since most of my whiskeys are single barrels, I like to make a really sort of deliberate examination of what it does to the flavor to change my ingredients and to try to change them as thoughtfully as I possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do it gently or you can have wild swings in the flavor. So what's your, as, as Pat, Pat had a question he wanted to ask was, uh, cause, cause you, you like to distill a lot of things. What's your favorite thing to distill? <laughs> it's like my children. It depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> Brandy good. is always fun. I will say you do when you do whiskey all the time, it's fun to do brandy because it's, it's something you only get to do once a week, twice a year. So it's always that the seasonality of fruit is, is very different than grain. And makes those things especially fun just because there's there's a timing to it that really makes it more 
of of what you're trying to pull out at that moment the you know we do a lot of it so it has become a little bit more routine but i still think that um distilling gin is really really neat because there's so many different things in the gin wash all those different herbs and they all come through in different fractions off the still and it kind of gives a really good illustration of how fractional distillation works you know you get this citrus coming off at the beginning and then you get a big piney juniper blast coming through and and then you have all these different spices coming through so i i think that's pretty neat uh too i haven't you know when, whenever they're running gin uh and i come in in the morning i'm like oh hey you guys are running gin i always run over and taste some of the spirit coming off the still because it's just really neat to see where it is in the in the distillate so what what type of still do you guys have we have two, um, and they're both similar, just bigger, one's bigger than the other, uh, German hybrid pot column still. So they're essentially a batch process, a pot still, um, with a number of plates on top that we can configure, um, and a, what's called a, defleg, a deflegmator, which basically, you know, is a cooling chamber at the top where we can control the reflux. Um, so, you know, with those stills, essentially the, the, the German technology gives us the ability to um, produce from mash in to finished spirit in one run. So we don't have to do a stripping run and then a finished run. Um, we can do it all in one run. And that was kind of a time saving thing since it was just like a small family company. Um, so we have Ron, which is our 300 gallon uh, pot still and uh, Barney, which is our 100 gallon pot still. Um, but Barney is actually along with some of our other equipment um, gonna be sold soon. Um, because we're upgrading, we're getting a 600 gallon pot still to replace Barney. Uh, so we can triple our capacity in the distillery sometime by May or so. Um, we'll have that guy coming in and then we'll have to say goodbye and shed a tear for Barney. Cause he was a, he was our first one, our first still. So I have to ask what, where did the names come from and what's the name of the new one? Well, no, Barney, so Barney, um, has the coolest sort of name story, um, we, the, one of the first things we did in Barney, Becky talked about brandy, we did pear brandy. And uh, so, you know, in the typical distillation, we would do this, you know, have pear wine in the still and distill it. And then at the end of the night, you open it up and you spray it down with a, basically a hose. Um, and then it's steaming, you know, literally steaming out of the still as you go home at night and then come back the next day. And so we came back in the next day and the entire copper still had turned a bright purple amethyst, like really beautiful purple color, shining purple. And uh, and so we were like, holy crap, what the hell is that? You know, and so we got on the internet and actually got in touch with a Scottish uh, chemist who was, you know, with the distilling industry up in Scotland and told us that, yeah, with pear, that in the pear wine, there's a chemical called cyanouranic acid and when in low pH, which of course pear wine is very low pH, like 3.5, um, in contact with copper will cause it to turn purple. And so we thought that was just the coolest thing ever. Um, unfortunately, the color didn't last. You know, in a few days, it had tarnished to kind of this dull gray concrete looking color that wasn't very pretty. Um, but, you know, now in the patina of Barney, there's always this kind of purple hue. And so he always wants to be purple. So we call him Barney. Um, Ron, we named after Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec because this a big dude likes a lot of whiskey. And that was our big whiskey still. So we named him Ron. Um, the new still, we haven't named it yet. You got to see him before you can name him. It's like an Indian. You know, you, you, he has to see the child before you can get that name out there. His, his working name is Double Ron or D-Ron. <laughs> Maybe that will. <laughs> or yeah, or what, what was, yeah, what was his alter ego? Uh Duke, Duke something, the saxophone player. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right. So what size barrels are you guys using? Because, I mean, you're using obviously something I, I would say, say more unique because we don't hear we don't have too many people using Minnesota. I know that there's there's a difference in the oak and the, the grain of the wood, which imparts certain flavors to it. But what what about the sizes that, that you're using? We've been using pretty consistently a 30-gallon barrel. Um, one of the reasons is it was the largest barrel that I could handle by myself as I was the only person there full time. And um, up until <coughs> probably, was it 2015, I yeah, think, we like actually were moving our barrels. Um, we would bring four barrels, four 30-gallon barrels will fit in the uh, bed of a, a Ford Granger. 
and we could drive them to our Rick, our uh, our warehouse, which was a old horse barn, and we'd roll them down the ATV ramp and flip them end over end into the horse stalls. So you can't do that with a fifty three for mm-hmm. most of your uh, type things. So we we we've been fairly um, pleased with the way that the thirties have been working for us. Really get a nice balance of wood and grain flavor. And um, it just it just really fits really nicely with the um, the flavor of our spirit and the um, the the uh, climate that we have, as far as giving us a really nice rounded flavor that we're looking for. Yeah, we we do use the fifty threes now for the rabble rouser. Um, product alone and and the, but we ma- haven't had any out yet it's no still, it hasn't uh, come out yet but but the angel share for a four-year-old bottled and bond whiskey on a 30 gallon barrel is atrocious um you know we're talking 30 percent loss so 30 gallons goes in and 20 gallons comes out like that's rough um so the 53s are the re- are the answer to that you know having less of that evaporation um, but the, the but we couldn't do that until I had a, a warehouse that actually had um, you know like it was forkliftable. Yeah, concrete. So now we have away. we don't use the horse barn anymore. Um, but the it was literally falling down around us, um, and so now we have a building, a modern building, you know, that has concrete floors, and we can drive forklifts around and do stuff like that. So all right, so I have a question. You've, we've read read about. Uh, something an upcoming project you guys are doing with guar so i have to ask is one of you a closeted guar fan i mean how does that how does that happen you know with a with because it's as when when they read that it's like okay is guar whiskey there's going to be such a such a clash to them like something soft and smooth or it's just going to be this horrible bitey you know hard hard proof and thing so I don't make anything that's horrible and bitey. So (laughs) under their tough exteriors lies this smooth musical heart. (laughs) Yeah, they, uh, I will admit, I was not a Guar fan before. Um, I'm more of an easy listening kind of guy, Neil Diamond (laughs) and whatnot. But uh, (laughs) but I will say, you know, the whole thing has been a lot of fun. I mean, these guys are just having a great time with their, with their band and, and, you know, it's been fun to do press releases and, and honestly to work on the label art with the, with the band, you know, the band does a lot of their own artwork. And so, you know, when we started this, you know, it was like a 50, 50 collaboration. It's like, look, you guys will contribute your, your art and your, your, your whole band ethos. Right. And we'll contribute whiskey. Um, and, uh, and I was like, you know, I can't be drawing any labels with this kind of art. Like, I don't know how to do that. So they, of course, draw the art and then I make sure it fits into the TTB and gets approved properly. Um, I, actually, I have a bottle over here. If you want to see the preview bottle, I'll go, I'll go grab it real quick. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, let me get it. So did, so did they, did they have, obviously they approached you first. Yeah, it was kind of a, we have a couple different connections to the band through, um, you know, the networks. They're, they're, they um, reside in Virginia, so there are a lot of, of people in Virginia who know them. So they would also have seen our whiskey through their guar bar in Richmond. And um, they also have a lot of, of uh, they know people in, in, the, in the trade in D.C. as well. Yeah. So, so they're kind of local, yeah. huge here. This is the, um, let me see if I can get it on the camera there. There's the, there's the bottle. Can you get the light right? Yeah, I think it's showing up. So you can kind of see this ridiculous Eyeballs. eyeball with battle axes <laughs> and no, all thanks. this stuff. It was, like I said, a lot of fun. You know, it takes me out of like looking at the taxes and the accounting and all that kind of stuff. And I get to, you know, color and draw you know crazy metal things so it's been a lot of fun working with them now that was a is that a port finish i recall what's that is that a port finish dry that you're doing no, with that be port finish dry. he's using a couple different kinds of wood like um sugar maple and cherry wood um in this so Cheery, that's, okay that, that are 
basically, you know, native Virginia woods. So again, you know, Guar was as interested in kind of finding a flavor profile that was kind of Virginia speaking as well. Um, we had done six or so different trials with them and they tasted them blindly and the band pretty unanimously came up with the sugar maple and cherry wood finish. Oh, that, that sounds amazing. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it was a cool, it was like, what can we do that's a little bit different from all the other little bit different things that we're doing to make this bar bottle kind of special. So we, we got a question from the chat. John, he, he works at a distillery also. Uh, asking when you're filling a barrel with new make, do you hydrate the barrels first or you just put them into a dry barrel? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend, John, that you do the same. Yeah. <laughs> that whiskey leak out on the floor is not pretty. We laugh because we've been there. Mm. So what, given the climate where you're at, I mean, because, you know, every area, especially Texas, you know, Texas has come along in the last few years. And and, and I admittedly was very ignorant on purpose about a lot of Texas things and not really realizing just how, how much climate difference there was across that state. Um, and some of them, you know, have been able to do things to, to fight the Texas climate um, on purpose. But what have, have you guys had to, to do things because of, of your location? I mean... We, we embrace it, right? I mean, that's the heart of terroir, right? Is to embrace the climate, embrace what you have and, and make something that speaks to that climate, right? And so, you know, that's why local grain tastes different. You know, people, when we first started making this rye whiskey, 10 years ago, we'd take it out into the market and people would say, that doesn't taste like rye. And I would be so offended. I would be like, what do you mean it doesn't taste like rye? It's 100% rye. How can it not taste like rye? And what we had to learn, and this took me several years, was that what people were experiencing was terroir. You know, for, for all this time, Americans were drinking rye whiskey that came from predominantly either Kentucky or Indiana, right? And that's a Midwestern flavor. And, and it was a malted rye and all these different things that made it taste the way it tasted, um, which generally people would say tastes of dill or mint or those kind of grassy hay flavors. And ours tasted nothing like that. It tasted fruity and nutty and like pecans and things like that. And, um, and so it was really learning that that's what terroir is all about. And so with terroir, you know, also in the barrel aging process, you know, this vicious, humid summers where we have this really high humidity that is basically boiling off the alcohol, but leaving the water in the barrel because the air is so full of water, it can't absorb any more water. Um, but the alcohol comes right out. Um, that, you know, that kind of climate is, is what's causing our whiskey to age the way it does. If, if we were to take it and put it into, say, air-conditioned rooms, which we don't, or, or take it to Maine, which we don't, um, you know, it would taste totally different. And, and I would say also, you know, the last part of terroir that's really important for us that we embrace is the, is the water. You know, our water is Appalachian Mountain water runoff. You know, we have a, a reservoir um, we, the town, not we, the company, um, called the JT Hearst Reservoir up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, right, you know, five miles from our house. And, and uh, that is where we get our water from for the distillery. If you were to take pure and purified water, reverse osmosis or water from another state, you know, and, and use it to, to proof the bottles, it wouldn't taste the same. So those minerals are really important for that as well. So I have a question with this. So with this last year, which has been fun for so many of us, <laughs> um, how how were you guys able to to weather uh, to weather the pandemic? Number one, and and also how have you been able to find some progress in in uh, in your sales channels for for getting your product out? It's been an interesting year. Um, this year, I became president of the American Craft Spirits Association. So. One of the things that that's enabled me to do is, is really kind of see from not only from our perspective, but to get the perspective of people, um, you know, kind of across the country and how they're dealing with it. You know, we we were really fortunate. One of the things that the Virginia ABC did very quickly in the pandemic cycle was give us the ability to ship our product directly to consumers in the state. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a huge lifeline. Small businesses like ourselves keep very close, like precious gardens of emails. 
that we get. And what we were able to do was lean on that email list and use that as a tool to pr promote our brand to everyone who'd been there and done any activities at our place. And so it allowed us to actually increase our sales in our tasting room by about 40% year over year. Now that was offset by 70% down in the on-premise channels that we were used to relying on. So that's pretty typical. The 70% down on on-premise for small distilleries, that's pretty normal. Most small distilleries also saw a pretty big, maybe 50, 50 or so percent down over the year, year over year in their tasting rooms. The, the biggest thing that allowed us to avoid that was the ability to direct ship. And as our association saw this changing and saw interest suddenly by um, state governments at talking about, are there modernizations that we can do to the, to the system, to the alcoholic beverage distribution system to make, small, make it more small business friendly? And I think this is like number one of the kind of things that we could ask our governments to do, our state governments to do across the country. If you know much about, you know, the wineries in, in California, you'll know that there are wineries that make 100,000 gallons a year and they don't distribute anything through the, the, cha the normal channels, they ship it all. That's the kind of direct outreach to customers that could be really valuable for the smallest distilleries in this country. And the smallest distilleries are the absolutely the most common distilleries. Probably of the 2,200 distilleries that we have in this country, probably over 1,900 of them make less than a thousand cases a year. And most distributors want to work with them, but these, these small businesses don't do the volumes that make distribution work really well. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that most of these distributors want to work with them. Well, I'm not sure what I'm saying true. though, is that if you have the volumes, yes, they might want yeah. to work with you, but you don't have the volume. So how do you get there? Yeah. It's an on-ramp. You can sell to people directly. You can build your name in a given state. And once you've got the sales, then you get the distributors yeah. to come in and talk to you. It's just really hard. Distribution is Distribution really hard. Distribution is super hard. And that's why, how do we approach selling spirits in a way that thinks beyond the big distilleries that the whole system was built around servicing? Mm -hmm. Everything was built to deal with the number of small just a, a number, a small number of large distilleries. Yeah. And now we have a large number of small distilleries right. and it's time to rethink that. And, you know, we've had some luck. Kentucky just passed a direct consumer law. There are laws being um, written right now. They're in the legislatures in places like New York, California. Um, and we're hoping that we can start to bring those things across the country. Yeah, trying to get DTC, they call it DTC, direct to consumer permanency is a, uh, is a hopeful goal. And reciprocity, because even if you can ship in your state, it doesn't mean that other states want to receive your stuff. So I can legally ship to about seven states out of the 50 as a manufacturer. I am not allowed to ship to more than that. No matter what it says on somebody's website, website yeah. you are not legally allowed to do that. And so there are all kinds of confusion by, by consumers because they don't know the laws. Well, what we're trying to do is make the laws clear and make them so that distilleries can comply with them. You know, Drizzly and some of those fourth tier kind of of things, all they are is more margin, more retailers, and more gatekeepers yeah. between customers and manufacturers. It is it is a little bit like um, some of those um, delivery services for restaurants where they take a big piece of the restaurant's revenue and it's hurting the restaurants. It's not helping them, you know, and they're taking a big hit for doing it. Or like when you work with, you know, forgive me, but Groupon, you know, and, and then you're like, great, I have to give everybody a 50% off and then they expect twice as much. 
Um, so, so some of those things can be a little bit difficult. Um, I would add a couple things that helped us personally um, in the in the last year. You know, there was a period of time when we were selling zero alcohol for drinking and all of it for wiping on your hands. Um, and uh, so those couple months that we were doing hand sanitizer, um, we had been able to lock in a couple big corporate um, and governmental institution buyers that helped us, you know, big grocery store chains and the Virginia Department of Health and, and places like that, which kept us afloat during two months of zero beverage revenue. Um, so that was tough. Um, and then the other, the other thing is uh, now the new normal is uh, we're, we're working twice as hard for the revenue we've got, you know? So, you know, I think, you know, every month I must have 12 to 16 of these virtual type meetings, you know, meeting customers, which is good because we can meet people all across the USA. Um, but we've never had to work so hard to sell liquor, you know, every, every virtual tastings and, and um, online events and classes and things like that, like every night, you know, almost we're doing something. Um, so I think that's the new normal is that everybody's working a lot harder just to kind of keep the boat afloat. Yeah. So, and a uh, question that Tim had brought up was the, the, the shipping out of state, is that temporary or is that, is that something that's going to continue? It's out of state um, to most places right now. So we have temporary shipping in Virginia. So I can ship anywhere in Virginia right now, but if it's out of state, it goes through our distributor networks. And if you're outside of Virginia, you're not legally allowed to ship to Virginia consumers unless you go through the ABC. Right. So there's not yet reciprocity in Virginia. And who knows it when it'll happen. We know of <laughs> cases where it happens, you know, where liquor stores from say Florida will ship into Virginia. I've certainly seen that myself. Um, it is not legal but it does happen. So they're all in this gray area. And as a business, you know, it's like, do I want to put my business on the line because you get a violation with say the Virginia ABC and that's, that's our license that's, and that's our livelihood. So, right. And then we're done. And then you know, I go back to it, contracting. It's really unfortunate though, because customers want it because all the time we back before when people would visit the area, a lot of them would be like, Oh, I'd love to bring a bottle home, but I have to, I have to have a carry on on the flight and I can't, can you ship? And you'd say, no, I'm sorry, we can't ship. And, and I, and, and why, why shouldn't we be able to ship? It really isn't, it's, it's a no brainer and it's the kind of common sense uh, reform that we could really make be something that would give so many small businesses a real lifeline yeah if you can ship wine you should be able to ship whiskey i mean it's just a matter of fairness yeah. yes exactly so that's going to be as far as our association of small distilleries goes that's really going to be our next big project over the next several years is how do we build the groundswell of public opinion so that we can get these privileges extended because they should be there and I think customers would be happier and small businesses would be healthier for it. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's something we, especially on the show that we've all been looking for is <laughs> distributorship and for these small distilleries to be able to ship directly because for like somebody like me, you got you, well, you have people within the whiskey community that, you know, go after the BTAC releases and these allocated stuff for me, my BTAC and my allocated is chasing these uh, small distillery releases like you guys do. And uh, cause that, that's where my passion is with all this. And it's, it's very yeah. difficult to do unless you have somebody in state who can get it for you and mule it back to you or something like that. So. Did, are we still here? Did we, I don't know if we phased out there. It does kind of push everything sort of to a black market, you know, where there's all the, the trading sites and things like that. Some of which are legal and some of which are maybe a little sketchy, you know. So, um, you know, I know in Virginia, pretty much nothing's legal. Um, so <laughs> you know, it's tough. They, they Control state they, for a reason. They bust people right. all the time off eBay or whatever. So Becky, I just, and I wanted to, you brought up the ACSA. So I, that was something I wanted to ask you about was if you don't mind going into a little bit more about your involvement there and what you guys are doing with that organization. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, American Craft Spirits Association is made up only of small producers. Um, the, it's a non, a true nonprofit trade organization. So it is a, it is owned by distilleries and run by a board of directors made up of distilleries. And what we do is focus on advocacy for small producers and, um, you know, and basically all the education, we, we're educating, we're elevating, and we are um, advocating. And the, the, a lot of the activities that we do are all to basically help us raise funds to keep advocating because that is the work that takes the most resources is how do you get FaceTime in front of people? How do you get the resources to do outreach? And how do you still keep your dues affordable? So our conventions all fund those efforts of running the organization. And um, it's it's really been a amazing growth experience for me personally, as um, I've started to you know really look at how do you start to make strides um, as an industry in really changing things and what are the baby steps you have to take. The work that we did on um, educating the industry on hand sanitizers, that was done by a group of about 12 of us who we formed a COVID committee. And as soon as the FDA started issuing guidance on, on hand sanitizers, we would read through it and then produce educational content and trans translate it into English. How do, okay, what do distillers need to know in order to do this? And, and, and trying to keep people compliant, making sure that they're providing safe products to people to use. Um, when alcohol was really scarce and people would be talking all of a sudden, everybody's calling you wanting to sell you alcohol, but some of them are, are ethanol fuel plants. Okay, we knew people in our industry who come out of that background. So they gave an education talk on how do you get ethanol from fuel plants and make sure that there's nothing bad in it that's going to be harmful to people. All of that stuff was stuff brought by people in this group to the entire industry as a whole to make sure that everybody was doing absolutely the best work that we could do for our communities. And so that was that was a, a real game changer for me to think of, okay, now, now I've had this opportunity and as president now I have an opportunity and I have more chances to speak out for small producers. And what's really interesting about the bulk of our industry, and we are, we, our company is, is not the smallest of our distilleries anymore. We've been in this for 12 years and we've grown, but the smallest companies are ones that they're 40% or more of their revenue comes out of their tasting rooms. 40 more percent is sold in their home state. So that's almost all of their revenue from a very small piece of, of the country. And these people are the ones who really need the modernization to start happening for them to be able to grow their businesses. Because right now, the way that the pipelines are set up, it's just not friendly to small business. What do you see as the biggest roadblocks to that? Is it mainly state, state government, state legislatures, or do you see um, kind of that three-tier system is standing in the way as well, lobbyists perhaps for distributors or? You know, the, the, the challenge with, with advocacy is that there are always interests who like the way things, is, things are going right now and everything's fine. Don't rock the boat, we're all good, right? But, um, and, and the state governments are where alcohol is um, legislated in this country, so instead of being something that we can try to work through centrally in DC, this is something where we're going to have to work with a guild in every state and work in legislatures in every state. The good thing about it is that once you start to see some successes in this, other states are always watching to see what states are doing. Yeah. And 
there is an appetite to help small business now like there has not been for a long time. Well, and and at the state level, you know, like the control states like Virginia is a member of NABCA, the National ABC Association, right? So all these control states, 13 or so of them in the nation are talking, going to conferences or, or virtually now, you know, and, and like what's the best practices in Virginia versus in North Carolina or wherever. So, you know, like she said, you know, you start showing some success and other states would then probably seek to emulate that. Very good. I want to take a moment and shift gears just a little bit here. I've got a philosophical question for you that I've been wrestling with coming into this year because our focus as a show is on craft distilling and craft whiskey. My particular state, South Carolina, pretty much defines that simply as the volume that the distillery is producing. How do you, how do you define craft distilling? What is it to you? It's a, it's a tricky word. Well, I mean, it, it tends to be used to speak of small, just through craft brewing and all that stuff. Right. It's Traditionally. kind of become, it's, it's a shorthand for saying small independent. Um, and I think that's kind of how it's used most of the time. I think that in craft brewing, it kind of came from this mindset that the big beer wasn't doing good stuff and that there was a, def a, a, a deficit of high quality beers. And that was what led to this. What I think that we, we didn't have that problem in whiskey. Whiskey has yeah. been great. What it has allowed us to do as small independents is get creative. And I think that's been incredibly good for consumers because what that's also done is it's made big distilleries up their game and release more creative, more creativity on their, on their end too. Mm -hmm. So on the whole, you guys are in like this amazing boom time of great whiskey. Not to take credit for it, but I mean, Jack Daniels, it didn't, was me. Jack Daniels didn't do rye whiskey until we did. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, seriously, Jack Daniels <laughs> does freaking rye whiskey now. They never did rye whiskey before, you know, uh, when, when we came out with our Mosby spirit, which was our white, um, rye moonshine, you know, a year later, um, it came out with Jacob's Ghost, which was Jim Beam, I think, you know, and it's like Mosby Spirit, Jacob's <laughs> Ghost. It's both white rye. Like, come on, you guys are copying us. I'm, I'm only saying this somewhat tongue in cheek, right? So please understand. He gets a little, salty. A little sarcasm here. But the point is, <laughs> right, it's like, you know, they would have probably just kept on making Jack Daniels number seven forever if they hadn't had some pressure to innovate. From below they see um, what happened to big beer and they are absolutely not, not going happen. to let that right. happen to them as far as the word craft goes though back to your philosophical like if you just talk about the the linguistics of the word craft i mean i've been on tours in scotland or at woodford reserve and they are absolutely craftsmen right i mean what they do is beautiful and thoughtful and from good ingredients, making a good product that takes time. So from that definition of craft, they are absolutely craftsmen. But Becky's right, it's become a shorthand for small independent. And so unfortunately, you know, language is tricky and, and there's not a better term. There's been a lot of hand wringing and wrestling. You know, we're members of, of, of associations that represent large interests as well. And, and they're always like, don't say craft because it doesn't mean like we're all craft. And, and it's like, and then everybody <laughs> slips and says craft, including the people who said that. So, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a problem that I, you know, I'm not going to fix. Well, like I said, I think that the, the, the time that we are in right now is really where, I mean, there, there have been times when you've gotten cheaper whiskey. That's excellent whiskey. But at this time, you've not, you'll never see quite as many um, uh, unique and um, innovative expressions as you would have seen at any point in history. I would also say with, with a preponderance of, you know, distillers across the nation, just like in craft beer, you know, there will be some that are amazing, excellent little gems that you find. And there are going to be a lot that are probably kind of not very good, you know, and that's just, you know, let the consumer decide, you know, if 
somebody likes it, that's great. Let them buy it, you know, but that's what you get with sort of that free decentralized um, market. Well, that, that that's one of the things where that your job isn't just to sell the first bottle, it's to sell the second and the third and the fourth. Right. Anyone can get someone to buy one. It's if you can be good enough that they want more. Right. I mean, we had an interesting lesson. We learned this on the go. You know, um, you know, when when you talk about what's good about a bottle, you know, it's not just what's in it. You know, when we first started, we were engineers, so we thought, well, we're just going to put the best liquid in the bottle possible, and who cares what it looks like? We almost had the label almost looked like a generic label, you know. And as an engineer, I was like, well, all the legal things are on there. It says exactly everything it needs to say to be legal. Um, but that wasn't enough. And we didn't know because I didn't have a marketing heart at the time. I didn't understand how important that branding was to the whole package, the whole concept. And so, you know, we had been. We'd have never spent this much time on I eyeballs and knives. Yeah. But so, I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, I learned a hard lesson, you know, um, we had, we had some labels, you know, and we had taken our product and I was overseas. I was in Berlin at a bar show and, uh, and I was meeting with a bartender. A bartender walked up. He's an Irishman, but he, he was a bartender in Paris on the Champs-Élysées. And he tasted my liquid and he was like, these are great whiskeys, man. These are fantastic whiskeys. But he picked up the bottle. He says, but I will never have this in my bar. And I was gutted. I was absolutely gutted. I was like, what do you mean? He says, it looks like you printed it on a laser jet printer. And, and, you know, I didn't, but it, it did. He was right. And I was absolutely floored. And I came home in a funk, just a depressed funk the whole time after that. And Becky, as she so often does with me, grabbed me by my lapels and, and shook me and said, look, he did you a favor. He told you the truth. And so we had to set to, to rebranding and relabeling. And, you know, we went through this really big exercise to rebrand and relabel our bottles. And I think they really look pretty now. And I'm really proud of what we've got now. But we had no idea in the beginning of that. You know, if we had started with beautiful branding from day one, who knows where we could be today? It's really important. And a lot of people don't pay any attention to it at all. Well, and 10 years ago, it was easier to get away with that because with only you know, 100 to 200 small distilleries in the country. When we started, we were one of six distilleries in Virginia and there were none in DC. Right. And so we were their local rye. It didn't matter what our bottle looked like. They were always happy to have it. it now there's a dozen DC, uh, DC distilleries right. right now. And 70 in Virginia. And they all have good branding. So right. guess what? You have to step up your game a and you can't, you can't walk out with just any old thing you have to have something that people want to buy right because if people never buy the bottle because it's ugly it doesn't matter how good the juice is yeah and one thing when when uh we a week or so ago we, we did the the braddock oak rye and for whatever reason it just tickled me like the first thing is uh, ben had the bottle and he holds it up and it's like it's not green yeah, <laughs> and for I don't I don't know why it's like a, a rye a rye label that's not green. It actually it's unique and it stands out. It was like what I'm just curious. What was your what was your reasoning for that? You have the wine finish. That yeah. one is really yeah. tasty. I have some of our staff. That's their absolute favorite. Yeah, it, you know we 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 look for ways to be different. So I guess that's just our 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 method. You know, is to do different. Um, the, the, if you hold that bottle up, um, the tree that's on there, um, actually Becky just did it as a doodle in her notebook. And, uh, so that tree, you know, the Braddock it's, Oak it's was just her scratching in her notebook and we liked it so much. We incorporated I'm like, it. No, no, label. somebody's supposed to do a better job of that. But and we liked were... it. It was kind of cool. And, and <laughs> but we mean some other people. <laughs> well, me and Addie who yes. designed the label, but. Uh, it caught my eye because I picked up first time trying your rye was back October of 2020, uh, had some birthday cash and headed to the store. And that Braddock was the first thing that caught my eye going down the aisle. And I saw it and I went, Oh, that's Catoctin Creek. Oh, they have Catoctin Creek here. And then I saw the cast strength. And as yep. you can tell, that's been a well-loved bottle um, yes, ready for more. So, and that turned out to be my 2020 rye of the year. Um, you know, it's, it is, you know, you talk about the juice in the bottle. It, it really is fantastic. And between Thank those two and the, uh, we've got the distiller's reserve brandy as well. 
oh, nice. been, all of it has been fantastic. So I, I've really enjoyed exploring your line and look forward to doing more as well. With that brandy, you, you've gone a lot deeper than most people, I think. Uh, you know, you often don't see that brandy outside of the D.C., um, Virginia metro area. That's nice because, well, yeah, they had it here, so I was happy to pick it up. I, I like brandy, cognac, exploring that as well. So, yeah, it's American great. brandy, they've been saying it's going to be the next big thing for at least 10 years I now. I know, we keep waiting. <laughs> I love brandy. I think it's fun, and it's kind of uh, – it's it's great to see at least there's you know there are some producers out there making it and just like rye when we first started we were one of the first ones who made it from scratch and now there are a bunch of small distilleries making american brandy from scratch and i think on the whole that's something the market is so small that you never will see the big producers do that mm -mm. and unless there are because little producers are trying to find the cracks to fill out their portfolios and so it's really only because of that that you see these these things coming out and it's and it's wonderful peach brandy coming back yeah. peach brandy's amazing it should come back we we want more of that right and so you know i have people all the time who love the the some of the brandy finishes like we do peach brandy i i use the peach brandy barrels to finish whiskey and there or to we use the pear brandy barrels to finish our old tom gin people are like we need more and i'm like you gotta buy more of the brandy so that i have more barrels so that i can make more stuff because you can't just buy peach brandy barrels Nobody's selling peach brandy barrels. No. You have to make peach brandy in order to get them. And so it's it's really, you kind of have to kind of appreciate all these pieces of the ecosystem that go into it. Yeah. Patrick had mentioned in the comments about, you know, we're kind of going through a whiskey revival or, or something of the sort, if you will, right now. And I think part of that is you guys kind of hit on it. When Prohibition hit, coming out of Prohibition, basically we industrialized spirits. Yep. And so much of what was you would call craft was lost and it's sort of, it's slowly starting to build and come back. And brandy, I think is one of those things because pre prohibition brandy production in this country was huge. And like for my state here, we're one of the leading producers of peaches, but it's just this year, high wire distillery uh, in Charleston released a peach brandy. I think one of the first in the state in, probably yeah. since around prohibition maybe shortly after sure. but it's, it's just things that are slowly starting to be restored and uh, that, that again is i think what is so amazing about what you guys are doing as well i mean imagine a 13 year literal prohibition on your business like you can't ply your trade for 13 years of course people went out of business you know whole industry was wiped out you know there were 30 um distilleries in pennsylvania and um, after Prohibition, there were zero up until about 2009. I mean, that's incredible, you know, to think of that. If you were to say, you know, let's make pharmaceuticals illegal, you know, think of all the money and the, the, the institutional knowledge and everything that would just go away for 13 years. You know, it's just, we, we talk about Prohibition sometimes as just this like blip, but 13 years is a long time. You know, that's three presidential administrations. That's people retiring. That's people moving on. Right. That's people getting whole new careers because that there's no market for their skills anymore. Right. And, you know, or like in the bartending trade, you know, people who just said, screw it, I'm going to Europe and never coming back. And, and that's what happened, you know, because I'm a bartender and I have to bartend um, to make my money. Uh, I don't know how to, you know, lay bricks or whatever it is, you know? So, um, you know, it really, it really did wipe a lot of stuff out. And when it came back, you know, the, the few places that, that were up were, you know, selling industrial or industrial size distilleries that were selling uh, prescriptions and stuff like that, you know, that were able to keep it going for that reason. Well, it's interesting because someone was asking about whether we were going to try to work to define a kind of what it was Virginia rye, like empire rye or, you know, um, the American single malt category and all that. And I thought it's kind of not really in the, in, in the tradition of Virginia, when Virginia was the largest state of distillers in this country, the largest distillery in Virginia was, was Mount Washington. Vernon. Yep. It had five stills. 
Five little stills. Little stills. Five little stills. They were producing 40,000 bottles a year, approximately, in their heyday, which ironically was just about the same as what we were producing a few years ago. You know, so they were our size and they were the biggest in the country at the time. And and so to my feeling is that when you're talking about that, that everything was little and it was all diverse and there was no unique standard of what constituted Virginia rye. Virginia rye was rye made in Virginia. And that's that's kind of been our philosophy is let's just look at it as being rye made in Virginia and why get complicated about it. Um, I would say I just I put my glasses on so I can actually see the comments. <laughs> and I would just say to that comment that just popped up about only back roads to the distillery, um, but Adroit Theory and Catoctin Creek make it worthwhile. I would say, actually, I find the back roads to be the benefit. Um, <laughs> I would much rather sit on, on Highway 17 and 15 coming up into town than to sit on I-95 um, when a trash truck has turned over and you're waiting there all day. I-81. Uh, 95 <laughs> is the worst. Yes, it's a, the back roads in, in the, our part of Virginia are the treasure. That's really pretty. where you have some great I'll tell drives. whoever the person was commenting, I didn't get to see the name. I'll, I'll tell you some nice places to stop and get ice cream and pie and things like that. And <laughs> all of a sudden, those back roads will be really worth it. I, I will absolutely vouch for that because years ago, before I was married, a friend of mine and I just decided to take off a week and go tour Civil War battlefields up through Virginia going to Gettysburg. And we traveled a lot through uh, kind of off, not well, we didn't go 95. We went up more through the Shenandoah Valley and headed over to Manassas and whatnot. But we hit a lot of back roads and even going through West Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania. And that was, it was gorgeous and, and just a great experience overall. Get off the more trodden path and, uh, and explore and see some things you wouldn't normally see. So I mean, we've lived here. I'm an army brat, right? So I lived everywhere uh, in Germany and all over the U.S. And and I've lived. We've lived in Virginia now for 25 years, which is the longest I've ever lived anywhere by a long shot. And um, and it's funny because when I drive through these country back roads, even today, I'm like gobsmacked by the beauty of it, you know. And I'm just like, God, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be living where I do, you know. It's just beautiful. These stone walls and these horse farms and rolling mountains and trees and streams and stuff and and it seems silly but you know it, it really is a wonderful place and and that's why we live here and you know put our distillery here so i've got a i got a question well a couple of questions because we're we're coming up on our on our hour and we don't like to keep people too long and you're you're an hour well you're on ben's time but you're an hour ahead of me so it is it is getting late and you have to fire up some stills tomorrow uh, but do you guys have uh, preferred channels or channels that you recommend people to get to for, for getting your whiskey uh, online? Yeah. So um, for, for a lot of people, so we're in 27 States. So I should say that. Um, so if we're in a state where you distribute, where we distribute in your state, then we definitely want you to use your local retailers, right? So go to your favorite mom and pop liquor shop or go to total wine um, and ask for, ask for it by name. Um, so, you know, in most of the places where you are, you know, we really like to support the little local independent, um, liquor stores and restaurants too, right. Um, restaurants too, but you've got to, you've got to, you know, be persistent and, and say, look, I know Catoctin Creek is distributed in South Carolina. Just please do it. Cause the distributors, you know, they, they got a lot of things to carry, right? Some of these distributors have a hundred products to sell. And so it takes a, a, a voice in the wilderness to make that happen. Um, so, you know, as far as online trading platforms go, you know, Drizzly and all of those kinds of things, we definitely are plugged into that and, and, and can get stuff through those. Um, but I would jump on our website and there's a, a link on the website that for uh, where to buy and go to that where to buy link, click that. And then follow follow your way down to find your state, Florida or, or Kansas or, or Missouri or whatever, um, and, and get it through that. Because we've spent a lot of time getting it out to those distributors, and we want to make that work. Um, I would say if you're in Virginia, if, if we have some Virginia friends on, online, we will ship that shit to your front door. So <laughs> go, go to CatoctonCreekStore.com and click to buy, and we will ship it to you. 
And that's a really neat way to get all those special releases that we're now mostly only putting into um, distribution in, in the online store. So. So if we, I, I, I don't know, Ben, if you have any other questions, but we're, uh, yeah, we're coming up on the time, but we, we do thank you guys a lot for your time here. This has been, it's been a lot of fun. And honestly, we would truly love to have you come back, especially if you have anything else coming out that you want to get the word out on. Cause we, we have a, we have a lot of nerds that, that join in the chat or people who'd love craft whiskey and, and they love the conversations with the, with the makers and, and, uh, and we enjoy it as well. So but we can't thank you enough for your time. Well, I hope everybody stays healthy and gets healthy who's not healthy right yeah, now. Yeah, we can't wait to be on the road again, maybe yeah. by fall. But we'd love to come back. We enjoyed the conversation, guys, and thanks for the chance just to tell our story a little bit. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you all. And, and as Pat always says every episode, it's not the okay. size of the den that matters. It's the <laughs> love of the whiskey. There you go. Well, Cheers, everybody. Thank yeah. you for joining us. All right. Thank you. Let's get to it. One, two, three.